And you're not here either. Hey. Hello, everyone. Don't you are with going. Max McGillivray, editor in chief of Feedstock Global. We are live this evening. Camilla, what day is it? I've forgotten. Is it Monday Tuesday. 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 It is Tuesday, the 7th of December at 5 31. We're live on LinkedIn, live on Facebook, uh, hopefully live on, on YouTube, and also listening to us on our podcast series. Uh, with women in food and farming. Camilla, can you tell us a little bit more about women in food and farming and what a great and illustrious group and organisation it is, please? Sure. So Women in Food and Farming pretty much does what it says on the tin. Uh, it's a group for women who are working in the agricultural sector and food production to get together, share ideas. So we have these meetups once a month on the first Tuesday of a month. We normally, well, for the last year, we've been getting in a speaker and doing everything digitally, although hopefully we'll be going back to some face to face meetups in the near future. Fingers crossed. Don't want to jinx us. Um, it started off. Well, Christine normally does these intros because she was one of the founding members and I joined about two years ago now and have been on the committee since then. Is that okay. enough? Yeah, that, that, that was that's fantastic. Yeah, and, I, and um, Camille, I can't remember if I told you, we've had a lot of people coming to us directly to, to Beanstalk saying it's, it's great that, uh, that, that you're doing it and Beanstalk is hosting, but when can uh, women in food and farming go back to live events? And I, I think everyone, I think I, I need to, well, I, I think we've all got that sense of realism that uh, with everything that's, that, that's going on, we're probably going to have to live through like this for the for the next quarter, aren't we, Camilla? But um, having seen some of the speakers that the, the likes of uh, the fantastic Debbie Wynn Stanley and Christine and, and yourself, Camilla, have got organised. And we, we've had, um, um, ooh, am I going to break cover? Uh, we've had a major university contact us today because they've got two or three major speakers they'd love to have on, on this platform, Women in Food and Farming. Um, so, yeah, it might not be ideal that uh, you can't all be in um, Emily Norton's great offices in uh, and Savills in, in uh, central London. Uh, but to make up for that, we've got some great additional speakers uh, coming in in the, in the new year. But, but Camilla, rem remind me, what's, what's the topic? What's the theme of today? So today we're talking about agri-tech. So we've got the lovely Belinda here. Um, and Belinda and I met uh, through what was then Agri-Tech East and is now Agri-Tech E, um, which Belinda runs and spearheads. Uh, it's a fantastic membership organization for both farmers and businesses in the agri-tech sector. So I work for a company called Field Margin, which is a tech startup making software for farmers and met through going along to their events and also speaking at a few bits. And she's a really fantastic and dynamic person who knows loads about everything that's going on in the agricultural technology space. So really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Well, Camilla, you're you're an MC today. Are you going to invite Camilla? Are you going to invite Belinda in, please? Belinda, please come on up. <laughs> Lordy, <laughs> hi, Camilla. Lovely to see you. Thanks for the invitation. Well, thank you for coming. Excellent. So, so, team, what we've um, we've sort of concocted between myself and them um, and Camilla, what we didn't want to to do with uh, with Belinda, because Belinda, you. you well, we, we we wanted to have um, a, a round a roundtable conversation with, uh, with with Belinda about um, agritech, but not to do the normal uh, predict the future, Belinda. You know all the uh, all the answers because it's it's just a fascinating space at the at, at the moment. I've I've been lucky enough to go to a, a couple of events on on a private and a, on a public basis to hear on agtech, and there just seems to be so much. Uh, chatter about it and and Camilla I think that's why we're really keen to get uh, Belinda on and, and I know Belinda's a, an incredibly modest individual but she's she is a renowned expert not only in the UK but also internationally on this uh, on this sector so just to use you Belinda as a bit of a bellwether and throw some themes at you and just to get your 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 views as to where where, where we're going and and um, Belinda you're, you're going to absolutely you're going to ridicule me for this one we, we're doing a bit of word association in the in the office earlier and I said well we all know Belinda and um, ATE Agritech E what what is Belinda like um, and uh, one of the teams said well Belinda's a bit like a bit like a lighthouse I said what do you mean a lighthouse what she's 150 foot tall made of concrete and, and, and got one shiny eye no 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 um, it's like a lighthouse that this there's, there's, there's so many uh, traps and pitfalls within this um, agri-tech uh, sector that her and her colleagues are a bit like a, a lighthouse guiding people to the, the, the fair shores of ag-tech. 
uh, with the knowledge and the connections and the collaborations that they can create. So, so I think, uh, and I won't name him, Ian, um, described you as, a, as this lighthouse, be, being this individual, um, being this group, guiding, giving, giving us guidance in the sectors. Camilla, do you think that's a good description for Belinda? I think that's a wonderful description. I just wish I'd come up with it myself. I, I, I can't just believe, I, I can't believe I just uh, described Belinda Clark as a lighthouse and got away with it. So, so Camilla, do you want to, do you want to stay in, in on this and, and, and we'll just rattle it around to the, the three of us? Because it'd be, it'd be great to get some, Belinda, is that OK? Sure. I, I yeah, I'd, I'd like to get Camilla's views on, on some things anyway. So it was in my mind to, uh, to ping things over to Camilla for her views as well and indeed <laughs> everyone else on the call. But... Uh, Excellent. And, and, and well done, well done, Belinda. I've only done 178 of these. If anyone wants, has got any questions of Belinda or Camilla, uh, please put them down in the, in the chat screen. Um, and Camilla, Belinda, you'll, you'll be far better than me because I think some people have already um, stuck some some uh, some questions um, um, in in there. So so let's just let's just start this this off on on my my quirky res, uh, retrospective uh, look back. Um, Camilla, here's a question for you. Farmers Weekly ran a competition in the year 2000 uh, to, uh, to award the, the, most, um, the, the most valuable piece of tech that came into farming. So it was the year 2000, Farmers Weekly, 35,000, 45,000 subscribers. Guess what the farmers voted as the most valuable piece of tech over the last 100 years in the year 2000? Camilla, guess what it was? Oh, year 2000, I was eight. Um... Eight. I... Belinda, <laughs> Belinda, I was eight as well. Yeah, me too, oh. me too, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to, I think this, I saw something about this recently, and it was something like um, inorganic fertilizer. Maybe it was Roundup. I, I'm just going to go straight for the chase. It was this, it was the mobile phone. It was the oh. mobile phone that, that, was, that was voted the most valuable um, agricultural tech, piece of tech in the year, year 2000. And, and what's, what uh, still tickles me today about that is that that was uh, in the year 2000, 21 years ago. Um, and this still is so hugely valuable, uh, even more so. Just, just look at the, the likes of your software, Camilla, because unless you say otherwise, I'm sure I can get it on, on my phone. But none of us have got the same phone that we were using in, in, in 2000. But it's the, it's the extrapolation of, of that, that phone and, and that, that technology um, to, to where, where, where we're going now. And, and Belinda, does that, does that I'm try, trying to co correlate this to, to ag tech, do, can with with the uh, advancement of of ag tech, have we got this base like like the mobile phone, and it's just been built on? Uh, Belinda, you seen the same with uh, with ag tech that we started off with a, a particular um, product uh, being a software ver version, and it is it is then moved on, or am I completely out of kilter? Belinda, what do you think? No, I think I think that's right. I think there are some some platform technologies in place now that are. Sorry, you can probably hear my dog, she's hungry. Um, platform technologies in place that are forming the kind of cornerstone of future builds. Um, I'm hearing there are some left field, there's still room for some left field entrants. And I met a couple of them at CropTech a few weeks ago, actually. So I do think there is, I, I wouldn't say that the space has been completely filled, but I think there are some platforms upon which there are uh, innovations that can be built. And I mean, the smartphone is a beautiful example. and and not only we, I know we might come to this later, Max, but not just in in agriculture, but you know in in all sorts of sectors. You know, GPs are taking photographs of things on their mobile phone, uploading it to the cloud, and using it for diagnostics. So, as a kind of enabler, I think the the mobile has has really been a game changer in a lot of sectors, not least our own. Okay, and and Camilla, trying try to you, you think of every farm that we all know. Um, at the back of that that farm, they got a they got a, a piece of the of the yard that's got all pieces of redundant, um, redundant kit. And uh, Belinda very kindly sent me over a very, very good article that we'll happily share with them, um, with everyone uh, later on. And, and it's just sort of a, help me Belinda, just sort of stating that ag tech is a, is a bit similar, that there are enough um, um, uh, water, moisture, uh, wet, wet weather probes in the, in the back of people's uh, farmyards, as well as cultivation kit. And they've served a purpose, but time, time has moved on. Um, so, so Camilla, we're trying to stabilise this ag tech so we can all find the answer and the, and the right thing to deploy, the right, right thing to use. How, how can we advise farmers and growers as to what's going to be right ag tech wise to use now and in the future, Camilla? I think um, there's a lot of you know, the industry has moved forward so much from five years ago. I think you're very right, Max, is what you say about this graveyard of 
both um, cultivation equipment and also technology that maybe farmers have been burnt by having a go with something and it's not worked out in the way that they want. But I think ag tech has moved forward a long way from there, particularly in terms of new machinery and compatibility. But part of the way that any technology evolves is there will be some obsolescence and systems will move forward. But the good thing is, particularly within software components and chips, the cost of investment is much, much smaller than what you'd be looking at for, say, a new tractor to buy a weather station or and there's also new models like buying things on a subscription basis. So whether that's a weather station where instead of paying for the weather station up front, you actually buy that on a subscription model yeah, or even for the new robotics, having you know a little bot that just comes onto the farm for the times of year when you need it rather yeah. than having that big capital expense up front. Yeah, well, well done. And, and Belinda, do you think farmers will will be are, are farmers adopters of of technology? They they are, of course, they are. But they're also business people. And I was just thinking, hearing Camilla speak, then so we launched at um, Cereals in twenty fourteen, and we were very new then, so we didn't really have much to, to showcase. So we had a drone on our stand really as a hook to sort of attract people. And it was really interesting because farmers were walking past them. This is 2014 where there were a number, not very many, but there were a number of drone companies. So you don't hear about drone companies anymore. You haven't for quite some time, but there were businesses that were positioning themselves as drone companies. And I remember very vividly two farmers walking past and they sort of stopped and looked at the drone. And one of them said, what do you think about those? And uh, the other one said, oh, they're rubbish. And uh, so the first one said, really, why is that? Oh, he said, I, I bought one from Maplins. He said, had a bit of a fly about, he said, it was rubbish. He said, forget them. And it was really insightful how that one experience, and I, I often, I would like to go back to that farmer and see where he is now, mm, because yeah. if your first experience is not a great one, of course, you're going to say, I tried it and it was rubbish. So, um, you know, your question, Max, has been framed around what advice to farmers. I think we need to ask, we need to frame it around what advice to the tech developers to make sure that you know they're not giving too much data with no actionable insights. The data is not so granular that it's almost meaningless. You know, yeah. nobody can manage a one centimeter square resolution, or that um, you know it's the, the timetable is too condensed. Don't tell me about a, a mildew outbreak tomorrow if I haven't got the sprayer in the right place or whatever. Yeah. And then the the business about you know ongoing support. And I think the the article that we talked about was that the businesses are very keen to sell the initial setup. And actually, as the business scales, it then becomes very difficult to provide the ongoing support. And this is where we hope that things like, you know, virtual reality or augmented reality, these kinds of um, over the air service models. Uh, my car, has, I don't take my car into the garage, it's, it's uh, updated over the air. And those kinds of innovations that will be able to support these technologies going forward to stop seeing things that are rusting in the corner of a field uh, overgrown with nettles. Well, well done. Um, uh, Camilla, I would, I would love to hear your example, but my example of uh, Belinda with the drone is a farmer near me who spent the thick end of £400,000 on a combine. And for a year, he got uh, a free app um, so that he could uh, monitor the uh, the production, the the the, uh, the efficiency of the of, of the combine of the combine and the and the tailings and, and so on and so forth. And after the 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 year, um, he then had to buy the uh, the application, but he refused. Um, and when the uh, combine manufacturer asked him why he was uh, not not uh, taking on the the app, he said it was too expensive. So the combine cost him four hundred thousand, and the app was three hundred and fifty quid. And I just. Uh, so, so the, the the lack of adoption by, by that farmer, I just couldn't couldn't get my, my my head around it. And who's right, who's wrong in that case? Is it the combine manufacturer giving too much information that's just overwhelming the, the, the farmer? Or is it the farmer just not being, being an adopter? Camilla, have you got an example to, to counter uh, my, mine and Belinda's? Uh, I have, but on that Ooh. particular point, I've been in a very similar situation of buying a combine and having to buy the additional software. And although... We did do it. I think it's more that it just really smarts when you've had to spend so much money <laughs> on a piece of kit, which you then spend thousands and thousands of pounds buying additional belts consistently every season it breaks down. And so 
having to pay 350 pounds which i agree isn't a lot relatively on top of that is just adding insult to injury yeah, uh, uh, i suppose my anecdote that's along a similar line would be i think the theme that comes out of a lot of this is not getting the best out of a piece of technology mm. and so farmers aren't seeing the benefit so um another thing which similar to drones i think there was a lot of it's been cyclical in terms of the level of interest is satellite imagery and i went out to visit a farmer we were walking around their farm talking about what technology they were using and uh, started talking about you know do you use satellite imagery and they said oh yeah we've got um a system that we subscribe to for satellite imagery and we pay x amount every month um but i think there's something wrong with the software so we haven't had any new imagery for the last seven months but you're still paying for it okay we're still paying for it do, wow. do you think you should be and and that's you know, both that not getting the support to uh, getting the benefit from it but also really poor customer support from that mm. satellite imagery provider which uh, eventually if that's the sort of experience you've seen something that isn't there when you need it you're not going to keep using it mm. yeah and, and, I, and I, I suppose that, that comes on to this 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 next point that i wanted to segue into that um the, the number of farmers and also suppliers that i've spoken to there's that there's just such a myriad of information coming in and how does a does a farmer assimilate that all because currently unless you, you either of you um to tell me otherwise there, there isn't a one platform that can uh, collate all that information and tell the, the the farmer when to spray when when to sell uh when when, when to when to combine but belinda is there is, is there an answer to that or because because again we're referring to this article we'll post it up no um farm i know has has an it team um uh, to um to, to Camilla to sort out that problem as, as per uh, the, the the sat nav or uh, Belinda to sort out my um, issue with my my app or my my combine as I indicated earlier. It, it's, can you see an answer to this huge raft of data that's coming in and how farmers can process this and actually actually you use it get good out of it? What do you think, Belinda? I think we're in danger of conflating two different things. There's the the data tsunami that's coming from existing solutions, and then there's the fact that there are just an awful lot of different solutions and how would a farmer choose between them and I think the first point is um, starting to move I think I think there's a realization that data for data's sake actually isn't that valuable and there's a number of companies and organizations that are starting to help people make sense of data aggregate collate uh, clean it up give it back in a, a form that that can lead to actionable insights the whole piece around all the different kind of, I, I hesitate to call them me too solutions because they're not me too solutions, but at a cursory glance, it could look like that. And one of the things, you know, always talking to companies is to say, be really crisp about what your value proposition is, how you different to, you know, these other organizations, because at first glance, you could look quite similar. But, you know, I think in a, a relatively young industry and this whole kind of, I don't call agritech a sector, but the agritech space, I liken it to the comms industry and all sorts of other sectors where, you know, the gaming industry, where you have lots of these ventures, these initiatives that start, and you need that vibrancy, you need those startups, you need some to progress at pace, some not so fast, and then others will leapfrog others. And it, I think that's a really important part of the innovation process that you have these, these you set, you sort of light all these fires and you see which ones spark and, and burst into life. And I wouldn't want to suggest, and while that's confusing at the moment for farmers, I don't think it's going to be very long lived because I think there's a lot of market pressure for the, the, the dogs to die and for the good ones to, to thrive. It's, you know, it's a very Darwinian space out there. So yeah, I'm awesome. kind of relaxed that this is a process that the industry has to go through in order to find those awful phrase winners and losers. Yeah, so, so it's evolution, not revolution. So, so you, you sort of yeah. tweaked on it a little bit, Belinda. Why is this sector, I can't think of another word, sorry. Why is the sector so sexy? Why, why, there's so, why is there so much investment coming into ag tech on a, on, a, on a global basis, please, Belinda? So the narrative, I think, sells itself. And particularly with um, sort of Gen X, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people are wanting to do the right thing by the planet, by people, by plants, through animal welfare. So I think the overall 
narrative around climate change and food production and equitable uh, production of high quality, healthy food. I think that's that's sort of capturing the zeitgeist and there's been a, a trajectory of that for a while. I think there's also something about um, you know, farmers are, it's, it's, it's tough out there and things that will save money and make life a bit easier, I think are inherently attractive and, and why, why wouldn't there be? And I think from an investor perspective, they're seeing a lot of opportunities. And, and I, I know you and I've talked about this in, in the past about, you know, certain parts of the industry are attracting phenomenal amounts of money. And there's, I hope there's not going to be some disappointed investors because we really need there. And there, there have been, you know, this year, there's the ecosystem is growing up. There've been some nice exits, some nice acquisitions, some nice raises. Of, of funding to demonstrate the maturation of the ecosystem. But um, there's certainly a lot of hungry investors looking for technologies that will help uh, sort of manage, manage the land, produce food, uh, cultivate inhospitable environments, you know, desert tech and, and that whole kind of Middle East space, really vibrant and active at the moment. There's some very, not aggressive, I don't mean that in a, in a bad way, I mean very, um, uh, sort of active and vigorous searches for the kinds of technologies that will enable basically cultivation in, in sand and very dry, yeah. inhospitable environments. And we know there'll be more of those inhospitable environments as climate change takes hold. And, and, and I, might, I might be overdoing over this, but what I'm picking up from my sound is of, of speaking to um, ex-retailers and, and people in the ag funding community who've been in it for a while on an international basis, they've seen a lot of naivety of funds um, co com coming in. So I, I have my standard line that um, in, in the last recession, uh, a number of funds came into the ag uh, sector because they saw it as a safe haven. In this perceived pandemic recession, those, those funds who traditionally aren't in this space are coming in, lo looking at the ag side, but also really interested in this periphery of the, of the ag tech side. Mm -hmm. uh, but is, is that, are, are they, is it fool's gold? Are, are they just coming in and spraying and praying um, and hoping that they're going to create the, the next Facebook within within um, within ag tech and they're, they're going to be able to have stick on a billboard that they've helped save, save the world? Or well, Camilla, what do you think? Am I am I are you seeing that, or am I being being a bit naive? Am I my sound is a bit wrong? So, um, is your hypothesis that institutional investors who would have normally invested in land and those kind of agricultural uh, investments uh, are adding no, the, no, no, the, the, these invest these investors would normally invest in coal, and then they're now coming into um, into this sector because it's just they all seem to be a bit like sheep in, in investors. Um, so we we picked up that there's a lot of uh, there's, there's New York headhunters being deployed for some of these investors trying to find individuals that can guide these funds into ag and into ag tech and, and try and find the the the, the rich theme, theme of gold. Um, because the, the sector's figuratively on fire, but hence this naivety uh, comment that they just they, they don't know the, the difference from from a cow to, to a field of wheat, but they want to they want to get into the into the sector. And I don't know, uh, Belinda, Camilla, I don't know if that's good for the sector or that's going to cause a disturbance. Mm -hmm. Because one thing that we're definitely seeing is that um, the, the price has been paid for food businesses, fresh food businesses, just don't seem to equate as to where the market is because there's all this fresh money com coming coming mm -hmm. in. Um, and it is, is, is that good or has that been a disruptor? Um, is that good for the startups because they, they, they've got that potential to get a, to get a, uh, an investment in? Or are, are we on the verge of a dot-com bubble? Belinda. Gosh, there's a lot of questions there suddenly. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of money around at the moment. And you're right, there's a lot of interest from non-traditional players that are wanting to be in this space. And there's also some very dedicated funds that are saying we will only... Uh, invest in clean growth. We will only invest in low carbon solutions, wherever they may be. Now, I think that's partly driven um, by the climate change agenda and, you know, pension funds, people, are, you know, citizens yeah. are starting to say, we, will, we don't want to invest our pension into funds that are supporting, you know, fossil fuels, um, you know, there was the tobacco and arm, arms and things like that. So I think there's, there's a, a push from people, you know, who's I think all of us probably on the call, our pension funds are, we're, we're collectively pressing for this money to be invested in ways that we think will kind of intuitively feel, we'll feel a bit more comfortable with around the, the climate change mitigation. In terms of um, hype or hope, 
there are going to be some uh, some disappointed investors, but so there were in in dot com, and that's not to you know we still do have dot com businesses around. It was dis despite the bubble and the and the collapse of it. I think I'm going to shut up because Camilla was on the verge of, of answering the question, and and then you asked 27 more. So Camilla, do you want to go back to that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've you've taken um, the words out of my mouth, I suppose. Uh, so I was at Web Summit a few mm. weeks ago, which is a big tech conference in Lisbon. And the key themes that came out there, so it's basically bringing together startups and investors. Um, that's a big theme of the conference. And the key themes that came out were crypto. As an investor, how do I get involved in that? How do I understand fintech, um, health, and impact investment, and climate tech, and agricultural technology are very much being seen as part of that and so how can I take that money and do good with it? Um, is it good for the sector? I think, yes, it's allowing a lot of companies that maybe otherwise wouldn't have been able to get off the ground or would have been bootstrapping for a long time, which would hold their growth back to get going. But yes, the, there will be disappointed investors, but there always are. Mm -hmm. um, and, it may, and it does make for that vibrant competitive space which uh, Belinda, you mentioned earlier, lots of people able to get going and really grow and thrive to make sure that the best products come to market. Well, well, well done team, but is, this a, is it not a bit unfair? And, and just see if you can work through this correlation with me. We've got these new, new investors come, coming in who are very excited about the sector, but haven't we got established uh, large scale businesses in the sector that actually they should be, here comes the word, pivoting. So as an example, the, the likes of the chemical and the fertilizer uh, manufacturers, let, let alone the, 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 the cost of fertilizer going, going through the roof. But with the tech that's coming in that we're seeing, um, th there is going to be an answer to actually spraying less chemical and deploying less fert. So those co uh, companies are potentially going to be selling less products. So should they not be pivoting and looking to um, I've got it on my notes, doing a motor sector. So you think of the traditional mo motoring companies of the Audi, the, v the VWs of the, of the world. They've been absolutely challenged by the likes of um, Tesla, um, who've just ro rocketed in and got um, amazing va valu valuations. And those, the likes of the Audis and, and the Volkswagens are, are pivoting their model to go, to go electric. So should we not be seeing the, the chemical companies and the fertilizer companies, Camilla, Belinda, investing into the sector, trying to find um, new, uh, new, new tech that's going to be a benefit to, to the sector, to the farmers, but also, also to them, Belinda? I, I, go on, Camilla. Go on, Camilla. I, you go. I was just going to say, I think that that already is happening is seeing a huge amount of investment from existing big players in the space, which is a really very consolidated space. If you compare it to other industries, the number of both chemical and machinery manufacturers that we have is really very small. And the, fir the first agri-tech unicorn that we had, climate, that was bought by Monsanto. So they've, they've been, that was in, what year was that Belinda? I think it was 2013. Yeah, so so it's something that they've been looking at for a long time. And certainly for their business strategy, it's beneficial that they do pivot and look at new angles. But I would say there's actually a counter argument that it's better to have new entrants in the space and not having the same people who really make your chemicals and are incentivized to sell more chemicals, potentially making the software that gives you um, your chemical recommendations. But maybe I'm being a bit of a skeptic. Yeah, I just, I'll obviously come back to you in a minute. I just, I just think there's a correlation a bit like with the Unilever Nestle, that they're, they're scouring the world, trying to find uh, new seed varieties and plant-based plant, plant -based foods because they can see that, uh, especially if, if the likes of the National Food Strategy actually do, does something in the, in the UK, they won't be able to sell as many Pop-Tarts and they're gonna to have to sell more products in the way of, uh, say, plant-based plant foods and hence why those bigger companies are trying to get involved in that sector. Belinda, you surely don't agree with Camilla. Surely we should be looking to, to endorse these big um, chem companies, fertilizer companies to, to, to invest more in the sector on, on, a, on a pivoting basis, surely. So they, uh, they are absolutely, as Camilla says, that they are on this journey. 
And uh, if you're keeping an eye on the trade press over the last, I think it's certainly in the last month to six weeks, Bayer and Microsoft have just announced a big strategic relationship. And that I think is very interesting as to, um, yeah, there's two sort of behemoths of, of their own industries coming together and really exploring what they can do that I think is, is very interesting. There's been you know, the, the Yagro um, relationship with Frontier, for example. You know, some of these businesses are able to be to develop their own internal platform. So um, BASF has the Zavio platform that, again, you know, will help farmers with uh, sort of precision application. Hutchinson's has got the Omnia platform. Uh, so they have been for really quite a long time. These these uh, those who are more traditionally active in the ag chem space have been seeing the role of the data and the digital element alongside their existing business model. And I think it's been quite exciting to see how that kind of rolls out and the kind of relationships that are starting to form between what you might think would be quite unlikely bedfellows. Um, and the, the shape and dynamic of the industry is changing in a fascinating way as these new collaborations and new relationships are being forged, because you either develop it in-house or you acquire or work with somebody else who's, who's done it. And um, what a smart move on behalf of Bayer. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a fascinating conversation between the two of us because Camilla, you, you're sort of indicating that uh, uh, some of these bigger ad co companies that they they should really be like a bit like a blockbuster when when they sniffed at Netflix and look look what happened to uh, um, to, to blockbuster on, on the back of that and you and Oh no, that wasn't what I was suggesting at all, Max. I've, I've, you know, from, from a business mode, I mean, perspective of those companies, they shouldn't be standing still and sticking with what they've always done. I was yep. saying intellectually from the perspective of the end user, is it the best uh, arrangement possible? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And have, guys, haven't we got a third theme here that we've got these investors, new investors coming in with lots of money, but they can't assist us. They've got no expertise. Uh, they're, they're thinking that um, just writing a big check is going to hopefully buy them the the, the, the tech, but it's, it's really hard, obviously, to develop that tech. We've got the likes of the businesses that you mentioned, um, Belinda, that uh, established businesses within the ag sector that perhaps can bring that expertise. The third theme, haven't we got the likes of, say, Airbus, um, TELUS Agriculture, TELUS is a uh, uh, the the Vodafone equivalent of equivalent in North America, and they've been on a on an ag tech journey for the last. Oh, Belinda, help me five five six years, mm -hmm. uh, looking to get involved in this space. So, so like the likes of the Airbus, Belinda, help me with this one. The Airbus, you think of them as a as a technology business that they've got um, so much intellectual firepower, and if they can redirect that um, into uh, the the ag tech world, isn't that going to further accelerate uh, th this this area? So is there, is there a combination to be had here with um, with new investment and collaborations with the likes of um, with Airbus and, and perhaps even with some of these uh, uh, existing players to cr create a collaboration uh, in specific areas of, of ag, of ag tech to further accelerate it? Belinda, what do you think? There is. I mean, as, a, as an industry observer, how exciting, what innovative business models we're seeing. And isn't this all fantastic and great stuff that, you know, people can write about for, for years to come. And I'd just like to kind of take us back to your comments at the top of this conversation about what does this mean for a farmer? Because actually, Camilla, do you really care about the Bayer Microsoft relationship or do you care about, you know, What's the ridiculous it? price of fertilizer at the moment? So I think um, while we can get very carried away on the shape and structure of the industry and a lot of these um, conferences are, are very much around the sort of the theory of of who's in and who's out and, and who's working with who actually bringing it back down to how this impacts the farmer is I think the great unknown at the moment and you know people are looking anxiously to see you know what companies like John Deere and Class are doing uh, as well as their um, ag chem and seed providers so I think we need to be, stay mindful that uh, some of these big investors, these institutional investors, they, as, as I think you sort of alluded to, Max, they don't, they don't necessarily have uh, heart and soul and skin in the game in agriculture no. or even agri-tech. This is an investment opportunity for them. And obviously the big companies are returning value to their shareholders. And that's kind of what it is. And we hope and expect they will want to do the right thing for the planet and for farmers as well. But I think for me, the big unknown is what this consolidation and change and exciting new collaborations mean for the farmers who are already facing unprecedented 
uh, you know, as we say, once in a generation uh, change that is really incredibly uncertain. So we might need to just play down the, the, all, the, all the big excitement in the industry because well, that's, that's just kind of adding another layer of complexity and worry. I don't know, Camilla, are you, do you feel it's complex and worrying? Uh, I, I suppose I'm a bit too deep in the industry to uh, <laughs> observe as a impartial farming participant. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it probably is complex and worrying to most farmers because I think for most farmers it's not particularly of interest mm -hmm. who owns who I think and the reason that I mentioned it is because I think that impartiality um, and the sharing of data between for example chemical like to know what farmers want and we very quickly realized that that was not a very productive or valuable thing to do because while we want to capture what it is that farmers want uh, the academic community uh, tends to take those ideas take them away write a grant proposal which may or may not get funded to do three years of research which may or may not then go back to the original farmer so that leads to farmers getting really fed up with being asked what it is they want um, I think it's pretty well established now broadly what farmers want and I think one of the challenges that we had quite early on was how to articulate that in the right level of granularity because it can be anything from oh something to control black grass to then something really quite granular and quite specific and just being careful as to how you articulate that sort of wish list for Father Christmas if you like at the appropriate level of resolution that is actually valuable for a tech developer or an innovator or researcher to be able to respond to. That said, I think anyone that is in the tech development space does that uh, without talking to farmers at their absolute peril. And, you know, we've put together a number of structures that will enable that sort of virtuous circle to be completed. Because I remember, again, this, this first series, it was very eventful serials 2014. There was a, a, somebody I'd been speaking to who had been developing a, um, there was a greening policy under CAP back in 2014 and he developed a calculator uh, using lots of data and anyway he wanted to go and talk to farmers to find out how it worked he went to one of the um, land agent stands at cereals in 2014 and he discovered they were giving it away free on their stand and I saw him and he was a broken man because he had remortgaged his house oh, no. in order to buy out his time to develop this thing give up his job and develop this thing and he said why why, why didn't anyone tell me so and that was that that person has always stuck in my mind. I don't know what happened to him, but it's always stuck in my mind the perils of developing something without having your finger on the pulse as to what else is going on in the industry and without talking to farmers and just sensing the temperature around you so that you're not innovating in isolation and then have a horrible shock when you discover that um, you're not as innovative as you think you are or you've developed yeah. it the wrong thing. I go back to my example of when Camilla was but eight and uh, the year 2000 when this thing was voted as the, as the most high-tech high thing for farming and no one no one knew that we needed a phone now we can't live, live without the, the the things and so it's uh, again asking asking the farmers what do they want when perhaps they don't know what they want because they don't know what's what's coming but then I suppose having yeah. the expertise of the likes of the, the two of you and the whole network within within the system to be able to ascertain right this is the problem this is the solution this is how we're going to deploy it and, and this is how we present it to to, to to the farmers but Camilla what's your take on what do farmers want um do, do we need to tell them do we need to educate them or, or do we work in collaboration with them to, to find out what they want I, I was about to say the the thing that you missed out of that uh, process diagram that you were illustrating there Max is the collaboration yeah, of need idea but then once you've got that up and running getting the ongoing feedback to iterate and improve and that's how you get to a product or tool that is genuinely useful and you don't have this applies across all products you don't have to have the finished product right out of the box when you start it's about iterating and working together to see which bits work which bits don't or at least that's the way that we work at field margin and we found is useful to improve the product yeah. and and, and team 
money? Uh, why are we all in business? For two reasons, to, to, to have fun uh, and to make money. Um, there's such a, a, a drama, dilemma, especially within the growing aspect, horticulture, fresh produce within, within the UK, that we're in the zeitgeist at the moment that so many people are looking to buy more fresh produce because of the, the whole COVID thing and they want to eat healthier, but, uh, uh, but they're, they're getting less and less margin from, from the retailers. Do you, do you think with, the, with this deployment of ag tech as, as it comes through, it is, it is going to work to assist farmers to be able to prove to retailers, to customers, the whole carbon footprint, the sustainability, um, uh, give them more efficiency so they can actually make more margin. But Belinda, do you think we, we will be able to have that, that magic dust aspect by deploying ag, ag tech ongoing within farming and, and fresh produce on that basis? Goodness, I hope so. If it's, if it's not, there's a lot of people wasting their time. But I do think that's an important point, actually, that, um, you know, again, a number of the tech developers that we've spoken to and have come to us have said, well, you know, we'll be, we'll be charging, um, you know, a wheat farmer, um, you know, 10 pound an acre for this. Um, well, that's, that's just too much, that's too much money on a, on a, you know, relatively, I mean, obviously prices are pretty good at the moment, but, you know, back, back when prices were not good, £10 an acre was a ridiculous amount of money as well, you know, the price will come down, these are the early adopters, and there's a real lack of understanding sometimes around pricing, certainly at the early stages, that, you know, these, these co-collaborators, these co-developer farmers that are working with the tech companies, they're doing that partly because they hope they'll get competitive advantage, partly because they want to advance the state of the art, but they certainly don't wanna to have to pay for the privilege because they've got an opportunity cost anyway in that they might have taken a bit of land out of production, there's their time involved, there might be some of the farm workers are having to manage a trial separately. So I think it's really important to also, within your and Camilla's sort of collaboration thesis, to be really clear what the business model of that collaboration is, what's the basis of that relationship? Because if so, if a farmer's putting in kind of what we might call sweat equity to help advance an innovation, they sure as heck are gonna hope and expect that they're getting um, a, a margin on, on being able to use the, the, the tech when it is um, sort of fit for purpose and, and at market. Camilla, do you, do you think ag tech is actually gonna assist the, the, the farmers and the growers on a, on a financial basis? Yeah, I would, I would hope so. Uh, and if, if it isn't, uh, I hope in some way it already is, or what we're working on it is. And if it doesn't, then we, what, what are we all doing? We should have Having a good fun. look at what we're doing <laughs> and try and do something that's a bit better and a bit more useful. Mm. Okay, so, so guys, just to wrap up before we get some of the, um, the, 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 rest, the rest of the team in, I, I don't want to ask this the, the, the nebulous question of where is this all going to be five years, 10 years down the line, but but we've seen the cycles of of the, the likes of we mentioned earlier the the, the dot com bubble. I, I don't think we're anywhere near that within within ag tech. But there's definitely as we keep on going on about, there's such an interest in in the in, in the sector. How, Belinda, described as described you and your colleagues at uh, Agritechy as as a lighthouse earlier. How how can we get a steer as to which direction we, we should go? Down, or, or should we just be voracious in information gathering and, and wait for other adopters to see how they get on, and then and then follow them? Or, or should we take a bit take a bit of a, a punt and, and look at uh, look at collaborating with new systems as they, as they come in? Belinda, if you were a farmer, what what would you be doing? Yeah, I'm glad I'm not a farmer. I'm going to be honest. I mean, I live and breathe all this stuff, but I'm very glad at the moment that you know, with all the challenges and challenges and opportunities, it is exciting but it can be it can be overwhelming i think there's a piece missing um that as an industry it's around being welcoming to other sectors as well because i'm really excited by the potential for the collaboration out with the existing and traditional players so we think of ag chem we think of machinery we think of um you know the the um horton the, the seed breeders but actually you know, there's there's some glass houses down in Kent that where they're measuring vapor pressure deficit on ornamentals using technology that was developed in the maritime industry that had been developed to be to use in harbors uh, sensors in, in in harbors for shipping, and that has now been brought into the industry and is now being used to detect the health of plants even before any other um, visible wow. indicators are, are seen. And I think we have as a collective industry we have a, a role to play in welcoming 
you know, construction, mining, um, aerospace, automotive, all of these, you know, I've just written a blog on electrification in, in agriculture, for example. You know, we're going to be looking to companies like Bosch and Dyson and those who actually are developing tech and are going, we think this might be relevant for agriculture. And we've seen time and time again some examples of that. So I think it's around providing a welcoming and soft landing space for those who are new tradition to, to agriculture and saying, this is how your stuff can fit. This is who you need to work with. This is how we can make it better. Because I don't think the answers lie solely within the existing incumbents. Okay, and, and one thing that we haven't talked about is, is government within, within the UK. I, I keep on mentioning this, this example of the Dutch diamond. What is the Dutch diamond? And I always forget her name, but there's this uh, amazing professor who um, was a keynote speaker, the City Food Lecture three, four years ago. And she majors on the fact that in, in Holland, there is this Dutch diamond, which is government, industry and education. And, and they work uh, on such a collaborative manner that the government looks to, within reason, give industry as much uh, assistance on a on a on a farming or horticultural basis. Um, and the the educational side is also linked in to to make sure that the the younger generation are getting the the, the, the benefits of that. Um, are we not? Are, are we missing something within within the UK that we we don't have that government um, support to to assist us to to further accelerate this the the, the, the sector? Camilla, start with you. Oh, that, that's a tricky one. Um, I haven't been hugely involved with, from a technology developer. It seems like there's quite a lot of government grants available, but haven't been involved in those thus far. So I might just pass that over to Belinda. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah no, I'm happy. So I, I see your Dutch diamond and I raise it a triple helix. Um, so historically, we would call that the triple helix, that uh, interrelationship between industry, government and, and the, the sort of the research base that also brings in education. And I think they're seen, if I'm going to stretch the analogy uh, even further, as the kind of three legs of the stool. And um, I personally think that government in the UK has been incredibly enabling around agritech. You know, there was the agritech strategy in 2013 that had 160 million of new money. We could debate for the rest of the evening um, how, how people feel about the way that money was spent. But there was certainly government intent to really kickstart the industry. It led to the creation of the four agritech centres. Okay. There was you know, grant funding, significant grant funding. We've now got the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, another 90 million. There's, there's policies that are, may not be visible. Some are very visible, some are less visible, where government, I think, is genuinely trying to do the right thing, um, whether the execution is, um, is, is what we would want it to be. Some people may say no, some people may say yes, it's, it's spot on. I'm not gonna comment on that. But personally, I think the, the triple helix slash Dutch diamond model is, is not bad, actually. It's potentially better in some other countries, but it's certainly a heck of a lot worse in some other countries. So yeah. I think, um, you know, we, we keep banging the drum, we keep talking to government about what's wanted and what's needed. Um, and I think there's been some evidence of delivery. Okay, and probably where I'm getting a bit confused is having done so many interviews with likes to say, Tom Bradshaw, uh, Vice President of the NFU, who, who just wants to see more government support in the, in the short term with everything in the respect of um, uh, lab, labour um, issues. Yeah. So Belinda, that you're, you're looking at it on a long term basis, that you feel that the government has been very supportive. Um, whilst I'm getting soundings um, in, 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 the, in the short term, government hasn't, hasn't helped as we walk, walk through, stumble through this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this pandemic crisis over, over the last 18 months. So you're quite confident that the government is doing uh, potentially as much as possible to, to assist the sector. Just to be clear, I'm talking through an innovation lens. Yep. So, um, you know, yep. there's a whole raft of conversations that we could spend the rest of the evening and I'm going to need more gin in my um, uh, gin and tonic <laughs> if, uh, if we're to get into that. I'm talking about creating an enabling environment for innovation, development, acceleration and adoption. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into the politics of, of short term uh, interventions in a, in, a post, in a pandemic. And I know Tom speaks very eloquently about, as he would in his role as the National Farmers Union, uh, that's, that's their job. But I think in terms of creating an enabling environment for the, uh, the, the creation of ideas, the creation of value, and to a large extent, the capture of that value, I don't think the UK has traditionally 
terribly brilliant at value capture, very good at value creation, but there is a strong awareness of the issues and um, certainly some a, a willingness and an intent to try and do the right thing around innovation, just yep. to be really clear. Well done. And, and just to wrap up before we bring in some, some of the founders, um, I've got my magic pen here, my magic pencil even. Um, so what, what do they say that the, uh, the, the, the pencil is mightier than the, than the sword? Um, I want both of you to tell us as to who you're going to write, email, to collaborate with, to further accelerate um, ag tech uh, to, to the benefit of uh, one and all. Camilla, who are you going to collaborate with? Who are you going to contact? Who are you going to um, email uh, to collaborate with to further accelerate ag tech, please? Good question. Um, why not Elon Musk? If he Way, can, brilliant. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not a, it's not an interview if you haven't got Elon Musk in there somewhere. If he can get us to Mars and he can get Tesla going, I'm sure he could do something for agriculture, whether it's on this oh. planet or another one. It's it's such an obvious one, but it's such a good one. Because you just look at the this, this disruption that he's caused, we mentioned earlier, within the motor sector and how he's got all those big manufacturers absolutely running scared um, because he's just he's, he's, he's disrupted such a bro broken model. Belinda, come on, you've got to better that. Yeah, I'd like to have a chat with Elon Musk about agriculture because I do drive one of his cars and um, I wonder if there's a, a, a Tesla tractor um, <laughs> pending. Um, I Who would I collaborate with? I think we would be, there's, there's an organization called the Food and Land Use Consortium, and they have done some really nice work around the size of the prize. So they have done some calculations. I can put the um, report in the chat. They've done some calculations around how much it's gonna to cost to adopt a more regenerative approach to agriculture, to uh, have equitable diets, to have a, a more, a sort of a lighter touch footprint on food production and the size of the prize is something globally allowed like 350 billion a year but the size of the prize runs into the trillions by 2030 and I think it's that size of the prize that we need to stay focused on because you do have to kind of speculate to accumulate so I think um, food and land use consortium and those people who are really looking at how how food production can sit alongside uh, kind of benign and sensitive production systems. Um, they're, they're the ones that excite and interest me. But I'd like to have okay. a chat with Elon if he's if he's up for a meeting, Camilla. I'll, <laughs> I'll carry a bag. Okay, uh, Camilla's, got, to offer. Camilla's got, got, got his number, I'm, I'm sure. Um, Christine, can you just come in so that you can wrap up for us? And, uh, um, as Christine's coming in, just um, uh, Belinda, a bit of a segue question, great question from Leslie Rusin, just asking, we're discussing ag tech advances and plant crop sectors where greatest development has occurred. We see some movement of poultry, pig, uh, agri-tech, but what are Belinda's thoughts for potential advances in grazing livestock? Does the industry need an equivalent to Agritech E as a hub for livestock agri-tech incubation in the UK? Belinda. Lovely question, Leslie. Thank you. And we do actually have uh, quite a lot of livestock innovation uh, in our network, things around um, like computer vision in chicken sheds uh, and being able to uh, see when chickens are moving uh, around the feed stations and water stations and being able to sort of monitor welfare like that. Uh, again, machine learning and computer vision for uh, facial expressions on sheep and cattle, would you believe, to be able to get early indications of uh, welfare and, and sort of incipient malaise before it becomes visibly obvious. So there are quite a lot, there's quite a lot going on. The, the focus has traditionally been on the breeding side, but increasingly around welfare, early diagnostic, um, and pre-symptomatic management of um, disease conditions. So um, lots going on, as always could be more, and we could introduce you to some people who are in that space. Leslie, if you want to email me, uh, we could have more of a chat if that's helpful. Thank you, Belinda, and well done, Leslie. I'm, I'm so biased when it comes to, to arable because I, I, I live in Suffolk, and the last time I saw I, I saw I saw a cow was on a on a, cheap, on a on a kids' TV program. So thank you for giving us a steer back to livestock. Christine, who are you going to write to to further accelerate um, Agritech, uh, please, with our magic pen? I don't have an answer to that. I was actually thinking that as an industry, we don't have um, sufficient leadership and coordination of what we do. Um, yeah. 
MP was um, once a minister in the um, car sector uh, on the motor, the motor industry. And then he, he spent a short spell in um, DEFRA, you know, when George Eustace wasn't in before he came back in again. Yeah, yeah. He just said to me, your industry is so disjointed. We get so many different views from all across the spectrum. You make it really easy as a minister to do nothing because there's someone somewhere that disagrees with everything. And he said the motor industry used to take it offline, sort out what they wanted, and they came with a spear at government for exactly what they wanted. And we yeah. had nowhere to go. We had to do what they wanted. And I mean, you know, going back, I was I, I was sort of shouting at the screen, wanting to get involved and being very restrained on, on all these discussions on, on carbon trading. Um, and you know the, the the NFU and the AHDB said they would work together and they would determine find a package that was great. But their key criteria was that it had to be free. Now, who's going to develop something that is going to is going to be free for everybody? And, and I just feel you know sometimes we're just not just not focused on what we really want to do. So my magic pen would be hauling the industry together and say, come on, let's sort out what we all want and go with a unified demand to the to government, to the you know, to the innovators, to all the investors and be really focused. Well, well done, but there's, there's probably a conversation for another day, but we've got a myriad of trade groups across all of our, our, our sectors that, so what, what are we Too saying, Christine? Okay. Yeah, okay, so it's good to see. We, we, we've yeah. got the number of trade groups and organisations that we were, what we had, you know, we that used to yeah. exist when we were the when farming was the biggest industry in the UK, and nobody or very few of them ever want to stop doing it. So we yeah. all keep going as opposed to coalescing and having a few really focused ones. And we've yeah. got too many organisations that are really worried about pleasing every member as opposed to leading for the industry. Yeah, well said. So, so every, everyone, just, just to wrap up, Camilla, can you thank Belinda? And can you find out from Belinda how, how we can find out more about Agritech E, please? Camilla, over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Belinda, for doing this. And I uh, emailed you a bit out of the blue, so it's very kind of you to agree. And it's been a really enlightening and informative discussion, at least your contributions have been. So, yeah, take, a, take it away. And there's a little bit more about Agritech E and where people... If they had questions or want to learn more, how they can get in touch. Well, thank you, Camilla. It's been a real pleasure. It's been really nice to uh, have a three-way conversation um, as well. So, uh, yeah, we are at uh, agri-tech-e.co.uk. Um, it'd be brilliant to uh, have any input and conversations with people. We've got some events coming up uh, around uh, the role of grass. Leslie, you might be interested in that, the role of grass as a, a crop, um, not just as a forage crop, but around carbon trapping as well. We've got some farm walks. We're talking about nutrition of plants and soil. We're talking about the role of light. So we've got a whole raft of what we hope are uh, interesting uh, opportunities to showcase different technologies. And I, our big one we've got coming up is around innovating for elms. So Camilla, I might revert to you offline on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Th Belinda. Thank, thank you. I think, I think it's been a, re a really stimulating conversation. I think it was great having um, Cam Camilla in uh, just to get her, her view from the sort of, sort of from the front, front line of um, ag, ag tech um, in comparison to my broadcasting um, uh, shenanigans and, 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 and your expertise, uh, Belinda. So I think that's worked, worked really well. Um, Christine, can you just wrap up for us and just tell us, uh, tell us what have we achieved this year and what, what would you like to achieve next year with women in food and farming, please? Yeah. Well, Women in Food and Farming have been going for about 10 years with three meetings a year in, in London, face to face. And then November last year, I think you, Max, were setting up Beanstalk and you, you sort of were saying, come on, let's do something. And I said, OK, well, should we do it every quarter? You said, no, we can do it monthly. And I said, well, I can get you speakers every month if everybody's going to, if, if people are going to watch. And it sounds to me from the, you know, you don't get many people that are watching it on the Zoom call, but the number of people watching it live or what. Oh afterwards on LinkedIn and Facebook you and so we've kept going so we've now done a whole year of our monthly speakers very huge variety from people talking about um, ambition to you know the sort of thing we've talked about today and um, I, I think it's been great and thank you very much to all our speakers to my steering group who helped me come up with people and for you Max for providing us this wonderful platform and being our, our sort of token man on the program thank you 
No, no problem. It still makes me tickle that uh, once a month I, I have to defend myself against all of you amazing individuals who've got far bigger get into intellects than me but if i if you could use me as a lightning rod to get the best out of you um whether, whether it be um judas bachelor whether it be belinda clark whether it be sharon Kennedy, uh, there's so, so many names and we've got so many other great names coming up but hopefully we can use this as a staging post ready for you all to go back to be, being in person uh, fingers crossing in q2 q3 q next year so if you can still enjoy enjoy what we're doing with what christine uh camilla kirsty debbie uh, Beverly and all, all the all the rest of the team. That uh, that that would be fantastic. Yeah. So I'll there's going to be no no there's going to be no breakout rooms today because we we've all got other thing, things to do. And Christine's just just jumped <laughs> off a train to to get to to be with us. So that's a that's great. They've had a big MDS board meeting today that I think was hopefully very very successful. So we're going to wrap up and then we're going to come back in the new year kicking and screaming, Christine, aren't we? Yes, we are not doing one on the fourth of January. Largely because, you know, I think there's people going to Oxford Farming Conference or maybe a little bit too early. So the first one is on the 1st of February. So it continues to be the first Tuesday of the month, continues to be at 5.30 for an hour. 1st of February is Safara Waterson of MDS, who's going to be talking about yeah. diversity into the food industry. And I have to tell you, the diversity that we have on the graduate programme, if we had that in the industry, we would be delighted. It is very successful. And we want to talk about that and hopefully everybody can learn from it. But I have actually got every single speaker lined up through to December of next year. Of course, you didn't tell me that. OK, fantastic. Uh, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. So I've got every, everybody lined up and um, we're hoping to probably have a face-to-face uh, -face one in June or July when um, I think it's going to be safest to sort of put one together and plan it and not have it cancelled on us. But uh, just wanted to say thank you to thank you to Camilla and, and obviously massive thank you to Belinda. Thank you to Max and to wish everybody a wonderful festive period and see you next year. Excellent. Uh, just to wrap up, what does everyone want for Christmas, Belinda? Oh, for this pandemic to be over. I, th I, th I thought it was going to be scare electrics. Camilla? Oh, I think I've got everything I need. Uh, just a nice Christmas with my family. Oh. Come on, Christine, top that one. I, I, I just want my kids home and my daughter's going to get married next year. So it'll be the last one with just us as a, as a, as a sort of unit, as a unit, as a, proper, as a family, as we, we've been for the last 25 years. Oh, fantastic. Well, everyone, well, well done. Thank you very much for today. Uh, be safe. Have a fantastic Christmas and a fantastic New Year. And we'll see you at the beginning of February uh, with Safi from MDS. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.